It's my nerd world, the Star Wars show, and on this week's episode, we'll talk about episode five and season three of The Bad Batch. An interesting thing happened while watching The Rise of Skywalker last weekend, and is The Rise of Skywalker better because of The Bad Batch? I've been doing deep dives into Dune, so we'll talk a little bit more about Dune and whether or not Star Wars moving forward should take a cue from the filmmaking of Denis Villeneuve and the success of Dune, and we'll get to some listener feedback this week. As always, thank you so much for checking out the podcast. If you want to find out more, head on over to MyNerdWorld.net. And the podcast is brought to you by the science fiction space opera series Embark. After Earth faces its end, follow pilots Taft, Katha, and their crew on a journey of survival across the galaxy as they fight for humanity's future among the stars. Available on Amazon.com. Just search for John, J-O-N, Justice, and Embark. It's an instinct. A feeling. The force brought you together. We're not alone. Good people will fight if we lead them. People keep telling me they know me. No one does. But I do. Long have I waited. And now... Coming together. Is your undoing. Confronting fear is the destiny of a Jedi. Your destiny. will be with you. Always. My Nerd World. And welcome to it. I am your host, John Justice, and I'm so glad you're checking out another episode of A Star Wars Show here with My Nerd World. You can always go to MyNerdWorld.net and leave me a comment. Either if you're watching on YouTube or you can email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com. Before we dive into Bad Batch Season 3 talk, a little bit more discussion about Dune, some observations that I have after watching The Rise of Skywalker this weekend and listener feedback. Uh, Let's start off here and we'll have a little bit of fun. You may or may not be aware of this, but Star Wars has been getting the meme treatment over the course of the past week or so, and I wanted to share with you the backstory of Star Wars, beer, and, well, memes. When I found you, I saw raw, untamed power. And beyond that, something truly special. Delicious Cerveza Cristal? What's going on with Star Wars and Cerveza Cristal? So, if you weren't aware if you're not online and not doing social networking. There's been a lot of memes that have been going around involving Star Wars footage and this Chilean beer, Cerveza Cristal. So, the article that I have here in front of me goes as follows. The original Star Wars series is very good. I'll be talking a bit about the original Star Wars series later on in today's show. This isn't really even a debatable fact now, nearly five decades after the first film, now known as Star Wars Episode IV, A New Hope, was released. George Lucas has famously made some questionable changes, the article goes on to say, to the re-released versions of the trilogy, including color timing, audio mixing, take choices, visual effects, and scene expansions. But there's one edit many of us hadn't seen before this week, on X, formerly known as Twitter, when a beer commercial was somehow edited into the film in Chile. 
The original Star Wars trilogy didn't air in Chile until 2003, and the films were shown without advertising breaks. So they added them in themselves. So instead of gifting Luke Skywalker with a lightsaber, Obi-Wan Kenobi opens up a cooler filled with ice and surveys a crystal. Around 2003 in Chile, when the original Star Wars began airing on television, they did this funny thing to avoid cutting into commercial breaks, said an ex-user known as Wendy, posting along a clip of the movie. They stitched the commercials into the films themselves. And they included this in the story. I've seen several of these online. There are loads of these odd product placements in the Chilean version of the movie. And none of them lean towards subtlety. So in response, users on X have been editing in their favorite films to include Cerveza Cristal placements. You know, it's it's interesting to me that after all these years... And everything that we have seen with regard to Star Wars, the original trilogy, this idea, you know, like in life that, well, we've we've seen it all. There's nothing new under the sun. Suddenly you end up finding out this little oddity going back, you know, to 2003, no less of what they did to the Star Wars movies in in Chile. It's really, truly Amazing. It brings to mind the fact that a lot of people don't know, but a lot of theatrical releases have gotten different television releases and had other scenes cut in that weren't available or are available anywhere else. I'll give you an example of something um, that's relatable to what we'll talk about on the podcast and certainly in cinema now. Um, and that is Dune. But this is the 1984 David Lynch version of Dune. Of course, David Lynch would go on to become a a famous, um, a rather eccentric film director. But early in his film, uh, in his filmography, he was tasked with directing the screen adaptation of the Frank Herbert 1965 novel Dune back in 1984. Now, I haven't seen it in its entirety. Kyle MacLachlan starring in that film, Patrick Stewart, Sting playing Fade Rotha in that movie. I've seen portions of it. Never watched the whole thing. I may do that this weekend. Um, just because the effects are wonky, it certainly is a product of its of its time. And by comparison to Star Wars, during the original trilogy, I mean, it really is a testament to Star Wars how fantastic that trilogy still holds up, even without the special editions. Compare, you know, when you compare it to a film that came out at the same time as as Dune, which is slower in pacing. Obviously, the subject matters a little bit more, you know, has a little bit more depth. George was inspired by Dune, and we'll get into more of that later on in the show. But there's a wonkiness and a lack of quality within the special effects in Dune that make it difficult to watch from, in in my opinion. But given that I'm just kind of entrenched into the Dune universe at the moment and really loving uh, the two films that Denis Villeneuve has made, I may have to go and check out David Lynch's version this weekend. The reason I bring it up relating to this Star Wars Cerveza story is that I was watching a documentary, a YouTube documentary, on the 1984 version of Dune. Last night, and when they released Dune for TV, they actually released an almost three-hour cut of the film, whereas the theatrical version was trimmed down to, I believe, two minutes and uh, two hours. Excuse me, two hours and fifteen minutes. Um, The television version was three hours long, and there was some added scenes at the beginning, a prologue to add some. Uh, further details to help the audience follow through with the uh, with the film. That three-hour version is no longer available anymore. And I remember watching other films. And I can't think of anything top of my head, but you know, we talk about the Mandela effect, things that the, that we remember that aren't necessarily attached to what happened in reality. I think part of that actually comes from that a lot of these theatrical releases prior to the you know the the VHS uh, revolution. Um, these films were were re-edited and cut uh, to fit either run times or you know to to shorten or lengthen their their television uh, releases. And Dune was a part of that as well. And of course, in case you weren't aware, David Lynch was originally 
interviewed to direct uh, Return of the Jedi. And there have been some YouTube documentaries talking about and speculating what a Return of the Jedi directed by David Lynch would have looked like, given what Dune ended up becoming, the 84 version. Um, A lot of people have speculated that Return of the Jedi would have been odd, especially given the films that David Lynch would go on to make in, in television shows, Mulholland Drive, Blue Velvet, Twin Peaks. Um... That being said, given how he created Dune, I think we probably would have gotten something similar because George Lucas was so hands-on with that original um, trilogy, uh, even bringing in Richard Marquand, who was a somewhat seasoned director, having uh, directed the the war epic Eye of the Needle. It's famously been um, reported that George was heavy in the production and pretty much directed to return of the Jedi on his, on his own. Uh, so anyways, I thought that that was a rather interesting story. I, I thought it was a joke at first. I didn't realize that was actually in the, the Chilean version of the movies that they spliced that in. I mean, talk about being confused watching those as a kid. If you lived in, in Chile, right? I just, yeah, that, that absolutely cracked me up. Something inside me has always been there. But now it's awake. And I need help. So let's go here. We'll talk about Bad Batch, uh, The Return, Episode 5 of Season 3. Um, I don't have a lot of thoughts about the episode. It had a bit of an Adventure of the Week vibe. That being said... Where we are in the story at the moment in Bad Batch, as they are trying to go and locate uh, the city where the clones are at um, to try to go and break them out as we start to set the stage for where the rest of the season is going. Um, It wasn't necessarily a filler episode, uh, but it did have that Adventure of the Week vibe. It was clear that Hunter and Crosshair we're going to need to spend some time and have to go through some sort of scenario to come back together as a team and to stop being so cautious or Hunter to stop being so uh, so cautious with relation to Crosshair. So we needed an episode like this to have them go through some type of adversity so they can trust one another once again. I think that's what I'm what I'm trying to say. I, I do. I'm really enjoying Bad Batch and Omega is. Um, really rising in terms of characters that I enjoy, which continues to bring about the question that I have of where does this character end up going in future storytelling and how is this whole thing going to going to wrap up? But I enjoyed this week's episode. I wish we got more. You're kind of left. And it's more, this is more about the, the world that we live in and how we go and consume our content these days where, you get a 27 minute episode and you it ends and you're kind of like oh is that it we got to wait till next week right and there's you know there's good and bad with that there's the having to wait aspect of it but at the same time you're desperate to continue your journey with these characters and we get so much content all at once these days or longer episodes that uh, it does leave you with this desire of wanting more with such short uh, episodes, but really had fun with it. Always like a good creature uh, feature. The animation is absolutely fantastic. A little side note, I was surprised that they ended up taking Echo's ship um, to the planet where Crosshair had been held captive. I thought that was a weird choice, um, and not exactly sure. Just thought it was just thought it was different that we didn't we didn't end up taking the Marauder to that uh, planet. That ship, by the way, has appeared in the theatrical releases. In the Force Awakens, there is a version of that ship on um, Takodana, a, ma- a, a Maz. Uh, I got stuck on on Maz Kanata for crying out loud. So that there's a version of that ship and it's yellow. You only see the very very back of it on Taco Donna when Finn is getting ready to leave with those two side characters right before he looks up in the sky to see Hosni and Prime getting blown to bits. I was just surprised that they took that particular ship and it could have just been a 
story choice to provide a different type of uh, vehicle. Although my son, Kyle, um, made a comment that I actually tended to agree with, and that was that the front of the ship looks more like a house than it does a spaceship, be that as it may. We all enjoyed the episode. It's nice to have some new Star Wars, um, you know, and it's just nice to be able to have some filler while we wait for uh, some more live-action content. Apparently... The trailer for The Acolyte, which should come out later this year, the pre The Phantom Menace um, High Republic, closer to the High Republic era uh, show that's coming out later this year. Apparently, the trailer for that show is ready to go. We don't have a release date yet. I imagine it will air sometime around when we get closer to the end of this Bad Batch uh, season. Also, just while I'm talking about news items, uh, for you Star Wars, uh, as you Star Wars Disney fans, of which I am one, but I haven't been to the parks in entirely too long, and I miss going there. Uh, Disney Star Tours is going to be adding Ahsoka, the Mandalorian, and Andor characters and locations to the Star Tours ride. And apparently we are getting... Um, and or and Book of Boba Fett um, physical Blu-ray releases. I'm hoping that will also include um, Ahsoka, but I haven't seen that announced as of as of late. So I enjoyed this episode. Looking forward to seeing where the adventure goes from here. Uh, it is one of my favorite animated shows, and none of these have been disappointing um, whatsoever. One of the things that I really love about it, though, is what this is doing for the storytelling moving forward. And this is where I want to talk and get a bit into uh, my experience watching The Rise of Skywalker this past weekend. We are the spark that will light the fire that will burn the first order down. So I've been in a space opera mood ever since going and seeing uh, Dune. I'm going to see Dune Part 2, specifically, um, again this uh, this Friday. And I had been working through the sequel trilogy, having watched The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi over the course of the past month or so. Um, hadn't had an opportunity to sit down and watch in in its entirety from beginning to... to in its entirety, beginning to end, uh, The Rise of Skywalker, a movie that I've made no secret that, that I love. And uh, finally had some time last weekend to sit down and watch it. And it was an absolutely enjoyable experience. I really do love that. Love that film, and I'll talk a little bit more about that with um, regard to where I think Star Wars may need to go in the uh, in the future. Something stuck out to me, though, on this most recent watch of The Rise of Skywalker, and I've talked about this before, and when this type of thing happens, I love getting into it on the on the show, and that is how new content that fills in backstory changes the dynamics of previous content, content that came before it. So I'm watching The Rise of Skywalker, and we're in the opening half hour or so of the show, and we get that moment where Poe says, somehow Palpatine returned, and we get the camera panning to all the shocked faces. How could this be? That's become a meme. As a matter of fact, I was listening to a Dune podcast reviewing part two, and they actually brought that line up in the podcast. I mean, it's one of the most repeated quotes. It's one of the most quotable items from The Rise of Skywalker um, that at least it's the first one that pops to mind. Very similar to what we get with uh, Attack of the Clones and the I Don't Like Sand. However, This, for me, has gone from what had been a meme and a joke, a line that never bothered me personally. And I I get a chuckle of seeing people joke about it online. But this time around watching The Rise of Skywalker, I didn't think of it from the meme, joke, social sphere aspect of it. I thought it more as a bit of brilliance in what the story group is doing with The Bad Batch. They're building the backstory, bringing new revelation to statements like that. Seeing what we've seen so far in the Bad Batch Season 3, and specifically um, Project Necromancer, the cloning aspect, Palpatine trying to extend his life, somehow Palpatine returned, followed by the lines of, you know, um, dark side cloning, Secrets only the Sith knew. 
Now, this has more weight to it. Now, when you watch The Rise of Skywalker, you know the backstory, and that moment doesn't seem like this big question mark or a yada, 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 Palpatine returned. No, now we know, or at least we're, we're beginning to know how this happened. Now, I had something similar with this in applying this same line of thinking to what we've seen in the most recent season of The Mandalorian. Less so because it was never really specific to what Palpatine was trying to accomplish that I talked about at length on last week's show, and that is Moff Gideon's attempt to create a Force-sensitive clone using the blood of Grogu. That was always singular to him, and as I talked about last week, these could be two separate things going on. Palpatine in the background trying to do his own experiments, while Moff Gideon, aware of Project Necromancer, is trying to create and duplicate the same scenario on his own. Ignore how we got to this point. Ignore that when they made The Rise of Skywalker, potentially they were just going yada, yada, yada to that particular line. Maybe they knew eventually they would fill in the backstory and this would become something of a more relevant piece of dialogue than what we are getting now. You know, focus on the fact that they are, in the moment, making content that makes The Rise of Skywalker more relevant. You know, will in the end the Lucasfilm Story Group end up creating this really incredible layered saga as almost an afterthought? And maybe this was part of the plan just in terms of mapping out the content and when they are in their story group meetings saying, well, eventually we'll go and tell this story and eventually we'll go and tell that that, that story. But as the as the consumer, as the fan, to begin to see those ideas come to fruition, there's a weight behind it that maybe even the story group wasn't aware of, at least for me as a, as a fan. Now, again, I'm in a mindset of Dune, and I, I love the mythology of what we're getting in, in Dune. I'm cautious to go and read the Dune book, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. I feel like whenever I see an interview with the author Frank Herbert and what was he was inspired by and his potential motivations for writing Dune, it gets a little bit too hippy-dippy for my blood. That being said, I do love the fact that over a long enough period of time, we could have this really amazing interconnected world and universe more so than we ever imagined with this Disney content being created. Now, this may all have just sort of fallen into place. This may all be, you know, happenstance and it may just end up turning out that this is going to be the case. Be that as it may, if that does end up coming to fruition, I think that's awesome. That we could have this really incredible saga where if you go and do what my son Kyle and I continue to try to do, even though we've we've uh, sort of slowed down our efforts, and that is watch all the content in chronological order. That when the pieces fall into place and you do watch it all in chronological order, you can have these really interesting moments that were at the one at one point the butt of a joke, but suddenly carry a level of relevancy that really enlightens and enhances the enjoyment of the viewing experience, and I'll give you another example and something I've never heard anybody go and mention before, and that is when the prequels first came out, they were given a, you know, a lot of a lot of grief. Many people didn't really like the the prequels. There's there's no, no there's no doubt about that. But now the prequels have um are are looked at with a sense of fondness and and love in a way they weren't before. Do we love the prequels now more because of all the content that's come afterwards? Do we have a better appreciation for The Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, and less so Revenge of the Sith? Everybody seems to sort of universally love that film. But for The Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones specifically, have people come around on their enjoyment of those films because of the very thing that I'm talking about right now, because of the content that came afterwards that lent context to those other stories and enhanced the viewing experience. And perhaps people just didn't even realize that that was really what was going on and why they were enjoying these films more so than they did before. As always, drop me a comment, talkshownerd 
at gmail.com. I would love to hear your thoughts as we continue with the show this week. I need someone to show me my place in all this. All right, let's get to some email listener feedback this week. Talkshownerd at gmail.com, and we'll get into a little bit more Dune talk. Friend of the show, Ray217, responding to last week's commentary about the other bridge from Omega to Ray, potentially, in The Rise of Skywalker. All right, so my apologies there. You don't know this, but in the middle of when I was recording, I got a text from work that I needed to go and address. So let's get into the listener feedback this week. And specifically, first off, Ray2017 writes, Omega does share Ray's kindness and compassion for others. That was something that I've always and still love about Ray is her kindness and compassion, even to those that may be undeserving. She still wants to help them. Raise compassion for Kylo when he was in his most conflicted is very much on the same level of how Omega shows compassion and kindness to Crosshair and wanting him to come with her and not be left behind. Yes, they also share a common ground for their love of animals, nature, and their own abilities to heal and take care of others as well, and showing some level of kindness to their en- enemies rather than to be quick to go for the kill unless they need to, which doesn't make them afraid to stand up for themselves, which makes them strong role models for kids. And they are Star Wars versions of the classic Disney princesses from Snow White, Cinderella to Belle. They are angels. Uh, thank you, Ray2017. I uh, always love uh, hearing from you. A uh, friend of the show, uh, John, writes in, Talking about Dune Part 2, get into a little bit of Star Wars coming up here in a moment. Overall, I thought Dune Part 2 was incredible with regard to my commentary last week. Certainly a bit slower burn at times, but I didn't mind that at all. But when the action hits, it hits hard. The visuals and audio, fantastic. 100% a movie you have to see on the big screen. I agree with some of your thoughts, though. Some of the editing seemed odd and jumpy. I think I noticed in two specific areas. The training montage with Paul and Chani seemed to end very abruptly, and then they were thrown into an awesome action sequence with the Fremen attaching the spice to, attaching to the spice harvester. The final battle between Paul and uh, Fade Ratha seemed to have an odd edit in it, too, at the end, but maybe that was just me. I could certainly be something where I just need to watch it more closely during the second watch. But you can certainly see how Star Wars has pulled ideas and themes from the original source material. Evil empire, warring factions, desert planets, huge creatures, nature versus technology. I really hope they continue with the story. Denis Villeneuve has done such an amazing job with Dune Dune, uh, Parts 1 and 2. I'd hate to see the story of these characters end here. As noted in the movie, this really does seem like the beginning. So to your thoughts about another Dune movie, um, I am hearing that Legendary, behind the first two films, is definitely interested in having Dune Messiah be made. Now, for those unfamiliar, Dune Messiah ends up taking place, and I only know this because I've been getting caught up on the stories, Uh, through YouTube documentaries, because like I said, I haven't read the books. But apparently Dune Messiah takes place some 10 to 15 years after the events of uh, Dune Part 2, which I really thought was was interesting, because obviously Dunes 1 and 2 tells the complete story of the first book, and Frank Herbert ended Dune, the first Dune book, just Dune, with this rather open-ended ending of this war getting ready to take place and then it picks up again to you know 10 to 15 years down the line my only question is whether or not denny villeneuve ends up doing dune messiah and i think it would be a mistake for denny villeneuve to not do another dune movie and to sort of round out the um trilogy so let's talk a little bit more about this I, i'll get into star wars but let's get into uh, some some dune talk some of the things that that i've learned and just my observations after having spent some time getting into the dune universe more so than i ever have before in my life this is not going to go the way you think I started watching A New Hope this week, a movie that I know frontwards and, and, and backwards, right? Not 
I'm, I'm more familiar with with the first Star Wars than I am any other Star Wars movie, but I'm familiar with all of them to the point where I have them all memorized. But because I've been in this Dune mood, and George Lucas was obviously, as we went through on last week's episode, very much inspired by Dune when creating um, Star Wars, it really got me thinking about the future of Star Wars and whether or not Star Wars needs to mature a little bit and perhaps take a cue from what Denny Villeneuve has made with Dune and how well it's doing relative, you know, relatively speaking at the box office. It's not getting these prior Marvel blockbuster numbers or even Star Wars movie numbers. Uh, But for a film of this size, this scope, with this source material, of this length, it's doing very, very well. And better than the Dune Part 1 movie did on its first release. I'm reminded of when Christopher Nolan tackled the Batman franchise and how he brought a level of maturity to the superhero movie genre. Marvel has taken its hits over the course of the past several films. People are burned out. I don't think they're burned out so much on the Marvel mythology, but more just burned out on seeing the same things over and over again. In my initial review of Dune, I made the comment that, you know, why can't we get films that look like Dune does? And I don't want necessarily a slowed down version of Star Wars, but maybe we need something a little bit more mature. When you go back and watch that original Star Wars film, it's interesting to me because it is slower paced. It's an exciting movie. It is a kid's movie, but George really didn't dumb that movie down for the for the audience. People had a lot of complaints when the prequels came out because of some of the the sillier aspects of the of the prequels. Jar Jar Binks specifically, but some of the you know the poop jokes that were made and fart noises and things like this. And the argument's always been these movies are made for kids. This is always in Star Wars, but you know it didn't get quite that juvenile in the original in the original trilogy, and certainly not that first Star Wars. And as a matter of fact, watching A New Hope after watching the Dune movies, it's a really, really interesting experience because you can definitely see where George Lucas was inspired by Dune. And it's funny for me as an author, uh, having written seven books, I I go and I watch a movie like Dune and I see the mythology and it it, it makes me want to go. It inspires me to want to go write. It inspires me to want to go and and the way that George originally did, I'm... I watch a film like Dune and Denis Villeneuve and what he did with the story, and I, it makes me want to sit down and start another Embark story or perhaps a, a whole new story and craft my own mythology again. It's something that I tried to do in my Embark stories, but I kind of moved away from it with this idea of everything happens for a reason, a belief system within the, the stories themselves. And I quickly realized that the stories that I were telling didn't really lend themselves or the direction that I took didn't really lend itself to going much deeper with that beyond the characters having a belief system that everything happens for a reason. I initially created that to be something sort of akin to the force without making the force, something more aligned with Christianity and having the villain sent Argum in the opening trilogy of my series to adhere to that everything happens for a reason but he used it for evil saying he was doing evil for a reason and it's in a bit of the uh, subtext of the story but it's certainly not anything that I grabbed onto but watching A New Hope you can see George took what Frank Herbert did and made it more accessible created his own version there's no Benny Gesserit, but he has the Jedi, the power that uh, Paul Atreides gleans from drinking the water of life and being able to see in the future and the past. 
is something that you can tap into with this thing called the Force. He really took this rather in-depth, complicated mythology that Frank Herbert and created, and he made it palatable for a wider and accessible to a wider audience, tapping into the writings of Joseph Campbell. Now, what's also interesting to me is that what Denis, Denis Villeneuve has done is something very similar. He's drawing from the actual source material of the Dune novel, which is very complicated, which, you know, the mythology is very deep. And if you get further into those Dune books, as I've learned, they get really, really weird. I don't know how you could take a lot of Children of Dune or the other Dune stories and turn them into films without dramatically changing some of the subject matter because it just gets so out there. <laughs> <laughs> just in terms of the mythology and the strangeness and the weirdness of it all. What Dilly, what Denny Villeneuve has done is, in my opinion, something very similar to what George Lucas did. And that was he took the source material and he crafted this amazing two-part story based off the original book, but also made that accessible to an audience, paring it down a bit making it a little bit more understandable for an audience, something very similar to what George Lucas did, but telling a completely different story. I think it's one of the reasons why I'm connecting so much with these Dune films and why I'm a little reluctant to go and watch, or excuse me, to go and read the Dune book because I'm afraid that it's going to get too weird and it's going to turn me off from it a bit, but you never know until you start reading it and it's such a beloved classic that I'm curious to see what everybody is is talking about. A sidebar to this, I find it really interesting that when you go back and look at um, popular content made before VHS, before cable TV, certainly before the, the, the internet and the proliferation of entertainment and media, oftentimes you find that Somebody that was able to go and do something for a first time ends up becoming really, really popular because nobody had done it before. Whereas you go and take that content and place it into modern times, it's not as well received. So what I mean by that is I was watching a documentary on specifically the writing of Frank Herbert and Dune. And what I learned in that was... He chose to do this third-person omniscient type of writing where the points of view can change even within the chapters where you can get into the heads of the different characters even within a singular chapter. Sometimes somebody would do that, but they would actually... One chapter would be focused and you would be in the headspace of one individual and in the next chapter you would be in the headspace of another individual. This third-person omniscient is almost where you can hop from head to head to head of the characters. That's what I ended up doing with my Embark story. Just because I thought, for me, writing the story, uh, I didn't want to do it in first person, nor did I want to devote chapters to, to specific individuals. I wanted to sort of have this omniscient view to get in the heads of everybody. And I wonder if Frank Herbert's Dune, if it were released today, would have been as well received as it was back then because of how much content has come since then. Now... We're kind of in a time travel scenario because would there be as much scientific content to compare it to if Dune hadn't come before it, considering how influential the original Dune was to so much other content? Subsequently, George Lucas goes and makes Star Wars, and what happens there? That ends up becoming influential to the content that came afterwards, and Farther down the line, certainly a series that's not nearly or even close to being as popular as that is my Embark series, which is inspired by George Lucas, which was initially inspired by Dune, which I now find myself inspired to go and write. Talkshownerd at gmail.com. Just write me and let me know if any of that tracked whatsoever. <laughs> One more quick comment, and then I'll wrap up the show for this uh, for this week. I've thought about, and I need to put together a comprehensive list. But I've thought about doing a podcast if I can find somebody to partner up to do it with me. I don't know what I would call it, but I would love to do a movie podcast where we can talk about franchises that are completely separate from one another, but that you can actually put in the same universe. One of the best examples I can give is um, the Terminator 
movies could serve as prequels to The Matrix. Whereas the Terminator films and stories could be, with Skynet, the rise of the machines, and over a long enough period of time, those machines end up turning into what we end up seeing happening relating to the events of what takes place in The Matrix. You've seen similar commentary around the Blade Runner universe and the Alien universe. And you can actually bring in the film Soldier starring Kurt Russell, which has some Easter eggs in it that connect that film to the Alien universe. Here's an interesting prequel for Dune. Blade Runner. Now, which is also a little interesting if you want to go and connect the um, Alien franchise into this as well. Considering that Dune takes place somewhat 10,000 years into the future, Blade Runner 2049, having been directed by Denis Villeneuve, and the fact that a lot of the design teams were involved in both projects, while there's absolutely no direct connection whatsoever, I think it's interesting if you wanted to, Watch Blade Runner 2049 as a double feature with Dune Part 1 and consider them being in the same universe. You've just jumped ahead some 10,000 years with Dune. Especially considering that in Dune, while it's not tackled in the in the movie, I believe it's tackled in the book, where they've dispensed with computers and AI. Which is why in the Dune universe, everything has this analog feel to it. There's something very similar that goes on within the Blade Runner universe as well in terms of there's an analog feel to the way that they are going and looking at things. And as a matter of fact, there's actually a plot point in Dune 2049 where they had everything shut down and they lost a bunch of data when everything crashed. Something that I might do this weekend. Now, if I've got six hours to spend from back to back, which I may not, who does? But an interesting double feature. Blade Runner 2049, Dune Part 1, and then considering in the same universe. Talkshownerd at gmail.com is my email address. I hope you enjoyed this week's uh, episode, and I love hearing from you, so be sure that you uh, drop me an email if you get a chance. I hope wherever you are, you are happy, you are healthy, you are safe. I'll talk to you again next week, and God bless. Bye. The Force will be with you. Always. My nerd world.